wish to welcome everyone again to the uh, Wednesday night Bible class, <clears throat> to the class portion of the Wednesday night, where we're engaged in the study of uh, logic. Before we uh, get uh, started, though, let's uh, have a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that Thou has created such that we can reason with the word, that we can understand what it implies for us, and that we have been blessed and that we <clears throat> have been obedient to the word and are in receipt of its blessings. We pray that can continue to bless us as we study. Bless those around about us for the influence that both they and we may have. We're thankful for Jesus, for the things that he has done to assure our salvation. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I thought it'd be a good idea to, um, since we're in study, involved in uh, syllogisms and that we go back over this uh, square of opposition and get in more detail because I, I, I do recognize that it's something that most of you have never run across before and it may be a little uh, complicated because it's a it's a different way of, of looking at things, and we, in a sense, uh, use this all the time. We just don't put it in a, a formal uh, structure such as uh, square of opposition. So you see the uh, slide. Now I don't know who did this slide. I don't. You know, I, I think that they got something wrong here. It says all women are fickle. Well, that, that's got to be wrong. I think it's it was originally all men, women are fickle, fickles. And, uh, you know, the Finkels, you know who the Finkels are? The George and Mildred Finkel, they live down the street. So all women are Finkels, but they got it wrong and said fickles. But anyway, we'll just go with they they have their error in writing. But the square of opposition uh, takes this standard format. You got four corners, of course. And uh, for whatever reason, they're, they're called A, E, I, and O, the four corners. And I don't know that they stand for anything in particular except you know, the A is always in the upper left-hand corner. The E is always in the upper right-hand corner. The I is always in the left bottom corner. And the O is always in the bottom right corner. That's just the way it is. But the standard uh, statement uh, format is all or something. All women or fickle, just to use the uh, erroneous word that uh, whoever authored this put in there. All women are fickle. And that's called a universal. And the universals are always at top of this uh, square. And when you see a word all, that means everybody of that category are included. That's why it's called a, a universal. But the contrary, contrary to that is the E statement. No women are fickle. Well, when you say no women, you're including, you're including all of them. So that's also a, a universal. But it says no, no women of the entire uh, uh, universe of women, none of them are fickle. That's why it's a universal. That's why it's contrary to the all. No is contrary to the all. And let's just look at the uh, <clears throat> left side, the A, I. <clears throat> 
the affirmative affirmatives are always on the left of the square of the opposition, always on the left. Because you use uh, all women are something, and you're affirming something. And then you go down the bottom and you say, some women are fickle. You're also affirming something. So that's, that's the affirmative. The affirmatives are on the left. And you go to the other side and you have E statement, no women are fickle. That's a negative, no, none. Not one of the entire universe of women, not one of them is, is a fickle. So that's a negative. And you go down to the bottom and say some women are not fickle. That's also a, a negative because you're you're saying not, they're not something. So the affirmative is on the left, the negative is on the right. And as I said, you know, at the very top there, universal is on the top, in particular is on the bottom. When you're taking a a portion of the entire universe of whatever it is you're talking about, all women, you'd say some women, you're talking about a particular portion of the universe. And some women are not fickle. You're talking about a particular portion of the universe of no women. So the particulars are at the bottom. And you look at the, uh, again, at the top, you got the A and then the word contraries. Uh, that's between the A and the E. Uh, all or no, they're contrary to each other. So they're they're opposite. They're both universals. And but one's a, an affirmative and one's a negative. So they're contrary. You go down the bottom the subcontraries. You could say they're contrary to one another either, but it's in the bottom, so they, we say sub. And some women, that is a portion of the universe of all women, are fickle. But uh, contrary to that is some women. It's another portion of the universe of all women. Uh, some women are not fickle, so it's a subcontrary of the I. The O is a subcontrary of the I. They're both really contrary to each other. But uh, if you look at the uh, cross deal, it says contradictories. It forms an X. It goes from one corner, A to O and E to I. They're contradictories. They contradict each other. All women are fickled. And some women are not fickle down in the O. Well, you can't have that. If all women are fickle, then it's uh, it cannot be that some women are not fickle. It's just all women are fickle. Can't be any that are not. So they're contradictory. Nobody said not for no human. Did you mute yourself, David? <laughs> Should have. Should have. But anyway, the E in the upper left-hand corner, no women are fickle. That's the entire universe. But contradicting that is some women are fickle. Well, if no women are fickle, it can't be that some women are, are fickle. So they're contradictories. Now, these uh, A, E, I, and O are form relationships. And we, if you look at the top, the universal is at the top, and A and E are contraries. Both A and E cannot be true at the same time. All women are fickle and no women are fickle. If all women are fickle, there can't be any women that are not fickle. So A and E cannot both be true at the same time, but uh, both can be false. 
because it can be false that all women are fickle. And it can also be false that no women are fickle. Um, so they're, they're, they're contrary, and but they both can be false. Now down to the bottom, I and O. Both I and O can be true. You can have some women are fickle and some are not fickle. So that both can be true. But both cannot be false. If you are asserting that some women are fickle, then you can also assert that some women are not fickle. But it's got to be, uh, one of them's got to be true. And both can be true, but one of them's got to be true. Both cannot be false. And you see the side uh, uh, verticals, implica implicants or implications, one implicates the other. And we'll get more into that in the very next slide, another uh, picture of a square of opposition. And uh, it will better uh, demonstrate that. But the implication is if, if I, the lower left hand, corner if i is false that that means a is false also but but uh the the opposite of that is if a is true then i is true you could say if i is true a is true a is true i is true but if a is true then i is true and uh, therefore one implicates the other one implies the other. Now the other side, the E and the O, if O is false, then E has to be false. And the other side of it, if E is true, then O has to be true. If no women are fickle, then a portion of the uh, no women, there's some women, and they're not fickle either. So they can, they, uh, if E is true, then O is true. Now, remember, when we talk about some, we're not uh, saying that this is another set of uh, women somewhere else. It's part of the no. Some are part of the no. And it, uh, if you say some are fickle, you're not saying anything about the other portion that is not included in some. You're not saying anything about that at all. You're just saying some are not fickle. So if uh, E is true, then O is true. <clears throat> now let's look at another uh, square of opposition. Uh, got this somewhere else. Let me expand this out so you can uh, See it a little better. Let me reduce it just a little bit. You know, hopefully you can see the entire square of the opposition. Can we give uh, terms to these uh, uh, corners? And we'll be using it a lot, but I'll try to point out what each one of them means uh, during the discussion. So the A, we can say every S is P, or we can say all S is P. Uh, then the E, we can say no S is P. So if one is true, the other must be false, but both can be false. And you look down at the bottom, if uh, some S is P and then some S is not P. So if one is false, the other must be true, but both can be true. And contrary wise, both cannot be false. And the top one in the red, both cannot be true. On the left side, you know, they, they call it the uh, subalternation, you see the air going both ways. 
and it says rise with falsity and descend with truth. So if A is true, you descend down and I must be true. And when you rise with falsity, if A is false, and you rise up to A, it also is false. It's got to be false. You go to the other side, and you got the air, the, the line with airs on both ends. So that there's a relationship between E and O. And again, it descends with truth and rises with falsity. So you start with E and you, you descend. If E is true, then O has to be true. And, and we're going to get into examples to, to show these things, what these things are. So don't uh, get too frustrated right now. And the relationship between O and E, it arises with falsity. So if O is false, then E is false. It rises. So I, I think uh, we sent these out. So it, it'd be good to refer to these as we go through uh, some of these later slides. And I think in time, if you uh, if you spend enough time with it, it'll become clear. And 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 the purpose of these uh, squares of opposition is. When you get into statements, arguments and statements, of course, when you get into statements, you're not going to say every S is P, uh, but it may, statement may say all uh, 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 Jews are uh, Semitic, something like that, or no Jews are Semitic, that sort of deal. So whatever statement is, remember the uh, the being verb. We we'll put those things into one of the being verbs is was are uh, be that that sort of deal. When we do that, then we can we can place whatever argument that we're engaged in in the square, and we can tell whether or not uh, it is true or uh, not true. False or not false. For some reason I'm about to run out of battery. That may be why. That's not my power. Excuse me, I have to plug up or we uh, have a very short class tonight. There, now we go. Sorry about that. Don't need this card. Too many cords. But let's uh, go on with the other slide. But uh, keep these slides, these two particular slides, uh, handy because we'll be referring to them uh, in, in the later slides. And two, once you can master the, the square of opposition, you'll be a long way in, in understanding how to approach uh, logic. So let's go into uh, arguments. Because when you get into debates or uh, any sort of discussion, you may get into arguments. Now keep in mind, argument is not you know one person being mad at each other and yelling at each other. That's not what a a logical argument is. It's a, a statement of, of a fact or a belief or what have you. So you know, a study of logical arguments is, is basic to the study of formal logic. We have to know what an argument is. In formal logic, as I said, an argument is not a, a quarrelsome disagreement. And uh, that's what we usually think of when we talk about argument. That's a conventional definition of an argument, but in, in logic, that is not it. So a quarrel occurs when uh, people are irritated, angry with each other. In a formal logic, uh, an argument is simply a set of statements 
one of which appears to be implied or supported by the other statements. There are two types of statements in, in the one type as a subcategory. There are two types of statements in an argument. The first type is called a, a premise. And the second is called a conclusion. The conclusion is the point being made, or it's the terminus of the argument. Argument That's where the argument is headed. It's the statement that uh, at least has the, has the appearance of being supported by the premises, the other statements. And, and of course, the premises are those statements that support or imply the conclusion. An argument, a formal argument, never contains more than one conclusion. It can contain more than one premise and usually has a major premise and a minor premise. But uh, if you see the words or hear the words, uh, therefore, the so, consequently, uh, there is the expectation anyway that the conclusion to the premises is about to be presented. And when you get into a formal debate, they will use in the conclusion the word therefore. Uh, however, if a statement appearing first in the argument is immediately followed by words in, indicating a premise, the first statement is probably the conclusion. You don't have to have a conclusion at the end. Typically, in a formal uh, debate, you will have the conclusion at the end. So the statement uh, you are reading now must be a conclusion uh, because it is followed by the word because. I think I missed a line up there. Words that indicate premises are sense, cause, for, given, that, and so on. Maybe other words. And as I say, in a, in a formal debate, at least the, every formal debate that I've seen, the premises are always stated first. And, and the way it usually goes is the, there's the major premise, the minor premise, and then the conclusion, which is implied by the premises. So the following is an example of a formal argument uh, written in informal language. The Bible is the word of God. That, that's a major premise. And the book of Jonah is in the Bible. That's a minor premise. So what, what can we conclude from this? We must therefore um, conclude, here we state that it's a conclusion, that the book of Jonah is the word of God. That's the conclusion. Now, there are two premises here. The uh, first premise is that the Bible is the word of God. As I say uh, in, the, in the statement, that's the major premise. And the second, uh, which is the minor premise, is that the book of Jonah is in the Bible. And the conclusion that follows from the premises is that the book of Jonah is the word of God. Here's an argument that uh, is similar in form, but in which the conclusion does not follow the premises. The Bible is the word of God, a major premise, and the Book of Mormon is not in the Bible, minor premise. We must therefore conclude that the Book of Mormon is not the Word of God. But it says here, uh, Christians must, must take special care in situations like this. <clears throat> now, each statement, I think, that uh, we can agree with. Uh, but that doesn't mean that their argument is a valid argument. That's a good argument. And the question is, in terms of validity, the question is not whether the conclusion is true, and it is true, but whether it follows from the, from the premises. 
In this case, it does not. The premises contain no information about whether the Bible is the only word of God, even though it is. In the premises, if the if the premises had said that the Bible consisting of the six, six books beginning with Genesis and ending with Revelation is the sole word of God, then the conclusion would have been warranted. So look at the argument uh, where the area is a little more obvious. Given that the Iliad was written by Homer and that the Odyssey is not in the Iliad, we must therefore conclude that Homer did not write the Odyssey. So we see that the conclusion does not uh, flow from the premises. It is not necessitated by the premises. For the conclusion to follow, the premises would need to say that the Iliad was the only thing that Homer uh, ever wrote. Well, we know that he didn't, but anyway. So let's uh, <clears throat> go to another slide. Let me make it a little larger. So we want to talk about the uh, syllogism itself. Now, it's a particular form for organizing categorical, categorical statements into an argument. And remember, categorical statements are talking about a category of things. So a categorical syllogism consists of three categorical statements. The first two categorical statements are the premises, that is, if it's in conventional order. And the last is the conclusion. So the following is an example of a syllogism. All red plants are living things, and all roses are red plants, therefore all roses are living things. And we're going to give names to these, uh, uh, or, or symbols, to these words. Red plants, we're going to give the uh, symbol of M, and that really stands for middle uh, term. In P, we're going to give the term uh, P, we'll give the uh, symbol P, which really stands for predicate. Predicate is a thing that's uh, it's being acted on by the uh, subject. And then S, all S are M. And we're going to give S, uh, ro all roses, we're going to call it S. So all S are M. Uh, they're the middle term. All S's are the middle term. So the little three dots there means uh, therefore. So therefore, all S are P. Now let's, let's look at this uh, again um, in the, the conventional uh, the way that it's set out. So as I say, all syllogisms contain three terms. The terms in the, the above syllogism are S, P, and M. So in properly structuring, structuring an argument, it's a, you got to have a good understanding of what these terms are. And don't let the fact that we give these things terms. We just, that's what we do to make it simpler. The terms are called respectfully the um, minor term S, and uh, we also can call that subject. The major term is P, predicate. 
and the middle term is M. So the minor term M is the subject term of the conclusion. The minor term above was roses or S. And the major term is the predicate P of the conclusion. And this is a standard form. It's the way that it's uh, formulated and you can't be any other way. So the middle term, it's the term that in both is both in the uh, major and, and uh, minor premises, but it's not in the, the conclusion. And we said, uh, looking back up here again, uh, red plants is a middle term. We can tell it's the middle term because it's in both premises, but it's not in the conclusion. The middle term is never in the conclusion. And the, uh, getting back down here, the middle term, uh, the major term is living things, or P, the predicate. And the middle term is a term that is in both premises, but it's not in the conclusion. And it's called the middle term. It's not called that because it's not in the conclusion. It's called that because it connects the premises together. It is the one uh, word or term that connects the major and minor premise together. So in the above example, the middle term is red plants or M. It connects the two premises, major and minor premises together. The major premise is the premise that contains the major term. Traditionally, the major premise is the first premise in the argument. It doesn't always have to be, but typically it is. The minor premise is the premise that contains the minor term. And then in don't look for a middle term because it's not a middle term. Uh, that's just a, uh, there's not a middle term in the, in the uh, uh, or middle premise that is, I shouldn't say there's a major premise, minor premise, but there's no middle premise, just a middle term. So in the above examples, let's look at it again, all red plants or living things. So we get down here. The major premise is all red plants are living things. And it contains the uh, major term, living things. Living things is going to be the predicate in the conclusion. Here, here's the predicate. So the minor premise all roses are red plants, it contains the minor premise, roses, let's look at it again. Roses is the minor premise, red plants, the middle term, red plants up here. It connects these two premises together. It's the common uh, factor in both premises. So it's a middle term. So the, um, the above example, I said all red plants are living things. Uh, the minor premise, all roses are red plants. It contains a minor premise, roses. The conclusion follows because the argument is valid. And all, this, all it means is that the uh, syllogism has the proper form. It doesn't mean that the major premise is true or the minor premise is true. But if those, may, if the major and minor premises are true, and it's a valid uh, uh, syllogism, then the conclusion has to be true. Well, uh, <clears throat> you look here and uh, let's, let's look again at the minor premise. It happens to be false because you you know of some roses that are not red. Uh, there's yellow roses. Uh, I guess I guess they're white roses too, but they're all 
red, pink roses, and what have you. So the minor premise is not true, but that doesn't affect the uh, validity of the syllogism. This is still a valid syllogism. So um, just note that the uh, minor premise happens to be false and it doesn't affect the uh, validity of the syllogism. So let's consider the following syllogism. All ring planets are gas giants. So no inner planets are ring planets since no inner planets are gas giants. Now this syllogism is not in the traditional order uh, for standard uh, categorical syllogism. In a formal debate, you're not gonna find this. Put it in standard form, the following procedure is used. You gotta find the conclusion. In the above example, uh, the conclusion is no inner planets are ringed planets. That's the conclusion. We know this because it starts uh, with the word so, and it precedes the word sense. It's dependent upon sense. The conclusion after the so is dependent on the sense. So you need to find the major term. The major term is the uh, predicate of the conclusion. So let's go back up to the conclusion. So no inner planets are ring planets. No inner planets is subject. Ring planets are the uh, uh, is the predicate. So, which term includes ring planets? Well, the very first statement includes ring planets. All ring planets are gas giants. So that's where that's how you find the that's the major term. So you got to find where the major term is used. The major premise is the premise containing the major term. Uh, since the major term is ring planets, the major premise is all ring planets are gas giants. So we got uh, the major premise, the conclusion, and then the minor premise. So we need to find the minor, minor premise. If you've already found the major premise and the uh, conclusion, then the other uh, term is the minor term. It's a statement uh, which is uh, neither the major premise or the conclusion. We got we got there by elimination. In the above example, the minor premise is no planets or gas giants, or I guess you could say since no planets or inner planets or gas giants. As a check, we see that this contains the minor term inner planets. So let's rewrite the syllogism in, in the standard order. So we determine that uh, no inner planets are the ring planets, so we want that last, therefore. And we determine that ring planets is the major term, so we want that first, all ring planets are gas giants. And we determine gas giants are, are the, uh, the uh, middle term. So the the only one that's left is no inner planets or gas giants. And so that's the minor term. So again, keep this printed out and you may need to go over it from time to time to get these things straight in your mind. Well, I see that we uh, over time so we started with uh, this the syllogism and just to you know, we're going to cover some more of syllogism next time we're going to cover the mood of syllogism and you might want to read that ahead of time and but we'll get into it next time so thank you for your uh, attention hopefully it's a little more understandable now